Is this too explosive? <laughs> I've got a guardian angel up top called Thomas. And when I fall, he promises to come and attend me. Um, thanks very much, Peter, for your very generous introduction. I think uh, when you hear such um, gracious introductions, the wise thing to do is to leave immediately <laughs> and keep your fictional reputation intact. Um, when people ask me how I am, I always say rather cautiously, I'm not at all bad in this veil of tears. And asking people here this morning how they were, there was, I always got the same answer. I'm grand. I'm grand. So from now on, I'm going to say I'm grand in the Grand Hotel. <laughs> I spent months of my life talking with Jonah. I asked him a lot of questions about his vocation and he asked me a lot about mine. I loved the conversation. He's an unusual teacher, dear friends. You notice in the Gospels and in the Old Testament you're offered a very odd collection of teachers. The woman of Samaria. With all her partners. She's offered to us as a teacher and she becomes a great teacher. She converts the town. The man who spent all his time running around naked, remember him scoring himself and in the end he's offered as our teacher Jesus hopes that people will listen to him tell the story of what God has done in him in the gospels anyone can be your teacher anyone even a little child and Jonah is by far from perfect. He's not numbered, notice, among the major prophets, like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. He's placed in the second division. He's numbered among the minor prophets, a subordinate to the greats. And these greats are revered, aren't they, for their great commitment to the Lord for their fidelity to the word of God, for their unwavering courage in the face of opposition. They're intellectual giants. And when they speak, you hear poetry. Jonah, by contrast, utters one line. One line. Forty days more. <laughs> and the people of Nineveh will be destroyed. Clearly the great ones have earned their place. Um, they're single-minded and they're persistent. Jonah is neither single-minded nor is he persistent. I find him stunningly modern. He's like someone who's emerged from among us, you know, Someone who has to struggle to find himself. Someone who has to struggle to find a direction in his own life. And someone who has to struggle to allow God's way of looking at things to influence his own. He's always hesitant about life. He's temperamental. I like him for that. He's unsure of what to do. He doesn't seem to be at home anywhere, floundering, hesitating. He refuses to go where he's supposed to go. And I would offer him to you, dear friends, as the patron saint of everyone who's been appointed to impossible places. And there's a few people who could sign up to that here. And when you watch him, Sometimes you wonder if you're in a theatre watching a desperate actor 
stumbling around the stage looking for a compass to find an exit. Jonah wants to find an exit from God. And you say, how can you not like him? This minor prophet. Personally, I feel at ease in his flustered company. Not least because at the beginning of the last century, dear friends, the Redemptorists um, in London were known as the poor man's Jesuit. <laughs> Not quite there. Definitely second league. And when I, I gave a, a retreat to the Kiltegans, one of the Kiltegans said, oh, he said, um, we were known sometimes in Ireland as Jesuits and Wellingtons. <laughs> so clearly the Jesuits are in the major league. Um, and they certainly are now <laughs> with the first Jesuit Pope um, in the chair of Peter. And maybe that's why I love Jonah. Our beloved Pope Francis, and this is kind of unusual, asked people to read one book for the year of mercy. Just one. Here I think of the story of Jonah, a really interesting figure, especially for these times of great change and uncertainty. Go and read the book of Jonah. It's short, but it's a very instructive parable especially for those of us in the church. Francis celebrates the struggle of Jonah because Francis knows that Jonah mirrors so much of what we are. We are flawed, fearful, restless, sometimes driven by our own fear. John is opinionated. He's never shy about expressing his own opinion or thinking. Over against what God commands, Jonah is a real modern. He keeps on consulting himself. He takes a lot of selfies. And it's much more important for him to consult himself than to listen to the word of God. He sees God, as sometimes we do, dear friends, as a contestant, not as an ally or a guide. Jonah's very modern in the sense he's worried about his persona, his reputation, how he might appear in the eyes of other people. A couple of years ago in the, in the schools in England, the kids were asked what do they want to be when they grow up. The number one answer was a celebrity. Jonah's very anxious about his celebrity status. He wants to be right and prove to be right. Have you ever lived with anyone in community who above all wants to be right? You can make your own jumps on this one. The story of Jonah begins, and I love this, with a life interrupted. It's a typical biblical introduction. The first time you meet somebody you don't know anything about them, is when their life is interrupted. Think about Mary in the New Testament. When do you meet her for the first time? When her life is interrupted. You don't know anything about her before this moment. You meet her in crisis. She's not praying for a child. She is not yearning for a child. But her life is interrupted. Has your life ever been interrupted? 
Has your life ever been interrupted, dear friends, to such an extent that the interruption shaped the rest of your life? That's what happens to Mary. Her future will depend on how she responds to this interruption. Think of Joseph. When do you meet Joseph for the first time in Matthew's Gospel? When his life is interrupted. And he hears news, doesn't he, that his wife is pregnant. And he only knows one thing, and what's that? That he's not the father. That's a tough interruption on a wet Wednesday afternoon in your workshop. And he follows his gut decision to divorce her, and then his life is interrupted again. It's dangerous to go to bed in the Old Testament or the New Testament. <laughs> you have to take notes. <laughs> and his life keeps on being interrupted. These wise men come, and his life is interrupted go to Egypt. Goes to Egypt, his life is interrupted. Go home. And then when he tries to go home, his life is interrupted again and he's told, don't go home, too dangerous, go north to Nazareth. And you never hear of the poor man again. He probably died of exhaustion. <laughs> you meet Jonah when his life is interrupted. And like the beginning of the story of Mary and Joseph, that story will proceed through conflict. You notice, dear friends, every single human story proceeds through conflict. Everyone. Once upon a time, everyone lived happily ever after. It's not a story. It's a graveyard. If there's nothing in a story to fight for, if the hero or heroine never struggles, is never tested by adversity, is never tempted, never has to battle against outside forces or inside forces, the story goes nowhere. How will Jonah respond? To what God asks him to do. Will he say yes. Your will be done. Or will this new challenge. Prove too much for him. I made a pilgrimage. When I was in the Holy Land. To this place. It's a mound of rocks. But the interesting thing is. Jonah's name appears in 2 Kings 14.25, identifying the prophet who came, and this is the place here, gath Hepha, a town situated in Lower Galilee. All that remains of the ancient town is a large mound. Archaeologists dug through it in the 60s, but there was nothing and they gave up. There were no ruins underneath of any interest to them. But where Jonah comes from is three miles away from where Jesus comes from. Look up on the hill there, three miles away, and that is the town of Nazareth. Can you imagine Jesus growing up? hearing of the exploits not only of a fellow countryman but of a neighbor. Jesus of Nazareth, dear friends, compares himself only to one prophet. Who is it? Jonah, his neighbor. Just as Jonah, Jesus says, was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. So for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. 
the people of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation. Why? Because when they listened to Jonah, they repented. And there is a greater than Jonah here. I like to think that Jesus was a bit jealous of Jonah. <laughs> because he converted a city. Jonah's commanded to go to Nineveh. Now, the fascinating thing is, dear friends, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Have you heard about the ten lost tribes? The, tri the ten tribes of Israel were totally, utterly decimated by Assyria. Now, can you imagine, that must be the angel Gabriel with the text message. <laughs> Jonah, it, and Jonah's a countryman. He's been sent from this village here to the most sophisticated city in the ancient world. And he's the only prophet in the whole of Israel who has been sent to a Gentile city. All the other prophets railed against the nations within the security of their own country. Jonah's the only single one who's sent out to pagans. And it's not an invitation, is it? It's a command. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. Have a look at the present map. On that map, the, dear friends, you see the most troubled area in our world today. You have Iraq, surrounded by Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. It's the hottest place in the world today. You see where Baghdad is? Go up north of Baghdad, through Kirkuk, up to the second largest city in Iraq today, which is Mosul. That is the ancient site of Nineveh. Mosul came back into the news, didn't it, a couple of years ago. It was the first city in the world to be dominated by ISIS, so-called Islamic State. And what was the first thing they did in Nineveh? They blew up the tomb of Jonah, which is surprising since Jonah is honored in the Quran as a great messenger of God. There you have it, thanks to Google. God bless Google. <laughs> Nineveh now, dear friends, is a suburb of Mosul. It was very rich. It was very... Sometimes the soldiers were so efficient, one historian called them the Gestapo of their day. They had a charism for cruelty and efficiency. And now can you imagine that Nineveh there was destroyed in 632 BC. Okay? Now think about this. It was left untouched until the middle of the 19th century. It slept for century after century. Until a young British explorer, Henry Layard, went to Nineveh and he uncovered the great palaces which were buried under mounds of rubble. Have a look at, you see down at the right there, that wonderful carving. Have a look at this. This is one of the first selfies, I think, in history, 6th century BC. 
you have the king of Nineveh in the hunt. This is from one of the corridors of the palace of Nineveh. And they're all, dear friends, you don't have to go far to see them. They're all in the British Museum in London. If you go into the British Museum and you hang a left, you come to a great space called the Assyria Rooms. And they've got a whole long, long corridor <coughs> devoted to Nineveh. It's beautiful. And that is one of the, um, that's one of the uh, great carved alabaster tablets that are there. And of course, John is a countryman from Galilee. And he's been sent to this powerful nation to tell them in 40 days more they will be destroyed. Nineveh is north of Baghdad. Jonah is being sent to the Saddam Hussein of his day to tell them 40 days more. Sounds a bit like George Bush. Jonah, I love this, he's commanded by God to go east by land. So what does he do? He goes west by sea. I don't know if you've ever felt like that when you've received an appointment. <laughs> He's desperate to escape from his own vocation, from himself, from his own mission. Dear friends, we all know this can happen in life. We can suffer a sudden loss of enthusiasm for our mission not least when it leads us to the wrong address and the wrong crowd. Whatever obedience Jonah showed to the word of God before this time, and I think this to me is the heart of the story of Jonah. This is how I read it. And it's a great story of a struggle in vocation. And Jonah is being challenged, dear friends, in three ways, in his identity, in his direction, and in his outlook. He's called to be a prophet. That's his vocation. And he becomes a desperate runaway. Not only from his vocation, from his Lord and from his true self. As I said, he's, his direction is very clear to go east by land to Nineveh and he heads west by sea. He needs a good sat-nav, really. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a prophet, often when you listen to a prophet, the first word he says is the word of God came to me and this word I tell you. They were men and women who were dominated by the word of God. And now Jonah is dominated by his own fear. And that can happen in life. There's nothing extraordinary about that. Jonah's in meltdown about who he is, about where he should be going, about what shapes or influence or determines his choices in life. And dear friends, I think he's a great teacher because each of us in turn has to face the three questions, who am I? What is my governing identity? What's the most important identity about me? Because we're all a collection of identities, aren't we? And when you're born, dear friends, you're landed. No angel interviewed you in the womb to ask you, my dear, what nationality would you like to belong to? What color would you like to be? 
What part of the world would you like to be born in? Would you like to be very beautiful or very bright? Or just a wee bit of both? When you're born, dear friends, you're landed. And an identity is impressed upon us. Nationality, sex, family, tribe, land, language, and often religion as well. Much of who we are, dear friends, is what is given to us. And psychologists will argue that a lot of happiness comes from accepting who you are and not fighting it. Think of Michael Jackson. You all have heard of him. Who was a lovely looking young black kid who didn't like himself and ended up looking like some kind of strange creature. I think the lived answers to those three questions, dear friends, determine the authenticity of our lives. I think the challenge for all of us today, particularly in the church, um, is to ensure that our identity, our direction, and our outlook are on speaking terms with one another. That the choices we make are consistent with who we claim to be. That the way we look at people and the way we treat people is consistent with who we claim to be. That the way we look at the world, the way we behave, is consistent so that our identity, our direction, and our outlook are together. When those three, dear friends, are in working order, we call that, don't we, integrity of life. When there's a coherence between them. And that's Jonah's great challenge. And I've, that's why I love his story. His challenge is to be authentic. And that, in turn, is our challenge. Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship heading out to Tarshish. He paid his fur, it was nice of him, and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Okay, you see Joppa there. That's just south of Tel Aviv today. Nineveh is 550 miles northeast. Have a look at Tarshish. They called it the Great Sea. We call it the Mediterranean. This would have taken a year's journey from Joppa by ship across the Mediterranean, calling in, obviously, at various ports on the way. Tarshish is in the southwest of Spain. The point being that it's seriously far away. So he prefers, as we all might, a package holiday for runaway profits <laughs> on the Costa del Sol <laughs> to going to face his favorite enemies. And by favorite enemies, dear friends, I mean people that we don't have to work at to dislike. <laughs> it comes effortlessly. <laughs> and often with a measure of justification thrown in, so we feel good about it. Jonah has to leave his family, his country, and he hopes his God. Now think about this, dear friends. In the ancient worlds, a lot of the ancient gods were limited to particular places. 
Jonah's God, after all, is called the God of Israel. And the big question is, can you go to a place in the world where the God of Israel has no reach and no command? Well, you will be safe away from him. I don't know if you remember Naaman and Elisha. When Naaman was healed, the leper, remember what he did. He took two mule loads of the earth with them so that the God of Israel would go with them back home. This God of the land. And whatever was in Jonah's luggage, we can be sure there wasn't one thing. He wasn't taking any of the earth from Israel with him. Why does Jonah flee? And we're not told until later in the story, in chapter 4, where Jonah says, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? I knew you are a gracious God and merciful. I knew this. That you were slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and always ready to relent from punishing. See, John is a very good theologian. He's just a very bad prophet, if that makes sense. He anticipates the gospel. Jonah knows, as Francis knows, that it is the nature of God to be merciful. It's in his nature. Francis, in Evangelii Gaudium, the church must be a place of mercy freely given, where everyone can feel welcomed, loved, forgiven, and encouraged to live the good life of the gospel. Like Pope Francis, Jonah believes in the stubborn, everlasting mercy of God. He believes that the mercy of God is his governing attribute, and that God will not punish his favorite enemies. Jonah doesn't fancy going to Nineveh preaching the first traditional redemptress mission. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard a redemptress mission. We were supposed to be experts in hell. <laughs> I still remember, I was 11 years old, and I remember a sermon on eternity. And the priest said, you will go to hell for all eternity if you die in mortal sin. He says, you don't know what eternity is like. Well, I'm going to tell you. He said, think of the whole earth. The whole earth. The whole earth. And every ten years, a blackbird comes and wipes its wing against the earth. Every ten years. When the earth has been wiped away, eternity will only just be beginning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Lord. <laughs> Remember, Jonah is worried about his face. This is a very Asian story. He's worried about loss of face. I don't know about Ireland, but in England there's about 15 murders every year, which people try to call honor killings. There was one recently. A young girl gets pregnant from someone who does not belong to her faith or race, and her brothers kill her. They feel obliged to kill her to save the face of the family. Jonah's worried about his face. 
Because if you lose your faith, you lose. You lose everything. And he's going to bawl at these people in Nineveh and assure them that in 40 days they will all be destroyed. And then God comes in, smiling, heaping mercy on everything in sight. What's Jonah going to look like? A class A Egypt. And if there's one thing he doesn't want to look like, it's a fool. Jonah wants to be right above all things. And he suspects that God will prove him spectacularly wrong. As a prophet, Jonah has to believe that what he proclaims with authority must surely happen. And if it doesn't happen, he's going to look a fool. And looking a fool, dear friends, is not part of many of our understanding of vocation, is it? Looking a fool. I think that's why Jonah's a minor prophet. Because he's always fretful of his self-image. Look at the big boys. Think of Isaiah. I'm quoting Isaiah 20. This is what Isaiah is asked to do. Go and undo the sackcloth around your waist. Take the sandals off your feet. My servant Isaiah has been walking around naked and barefoot for the last three years. So will the king of Assyria lead away captives, young, old, their buttocks bird. Now, are you going to invite Isaiah the prophet to give the Korai <laughs> annual talk? You'll have to give him a big podium and tell him not to move. <laughs> Isaiah's not worried about his reputation. His heart, his mind, his soul, his body has been invaded by the word of God. And he wants to tell the people, when you look at me, you're looking at your nightmare. This will happen to you. Think of Jeremiah. You come out of dumb stores, and there Isaiah is, or Jeremiah on all fours. He's wearing leather straps around his neck and a huge wooden yoke. And you have a look at him. What are you going to say? Jeremiah, dear, I've, I've got a, a dress of a very good psychiatrist and he can really help you. The false prophets come and they take off the wooden yoke of Jeremiah and they break it. And Jeremiah goes to an ironmonger and he says, make me a yoke of iron. And he says to the false prophets, break that. He's demonstrating in his body that the people will be treated like pack animals. They will be led, yoked out of their own country into exile. He's not worried about his reputation. He's not looking in the mirror saying, God, how am I going to look at this? He's been invaded by the word of God. One of my favorites is Ezekiel. <laughs> the word of God comes to Ezekiel and says, now make sure everybody's looking, right? Don't do this on your own. Make sure they're all looking. And when they're all looking, make a hole in the wall with a little knapsack over your shoulder. Make a hole in the wall and go out through it. Make sure they're all looking. So, the people see Ezekiel making a hole in the wall. They say, Ezekiel, look, there's two doors there. Wonderful hinges. Doors are for going out and for coming in. Why on God's earth are you making a hole in the wall? Again, 
it's beautiful street theatre. He's symbolising in his own body what will happen to his people. They will go out through the broken walls of their city into exile, carrying a tiny knapsack. By comparison, dear friends, our sensitive Jonah is not in that league. His energy is going to be devoted to protecting his persona, guarding his image. And that's why he wants to flee from God. You wish he'd read a psalm, beloved of us all. Oh, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your face? If I climb the heavens, you are there. If I lie in the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and dwell at the sea's farthest end, even there your hand would lead me, your right hand would hold me fast.